Let me invite you to take your Bible and go with me again to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. It is the last chapter in the book, so it comes right before the book of Song of Solomon. Ecclesiastes in chapter number 12. And either for good or ill, depending on what you thought of the series in Ecclesiastes, you'll be delighted to know, I guess, I hope, uh, this is the last sermon in Ecclesiastes. So we're finishing the book. We're in the last chapter. Let's pause now and have a word of prayer. Our Lord, we're very grateful already for the time we've had to meet with you to think about these songs. It is sweet to trust in Jesus. You don't fail us in the hour of our crisis. We can take you at your word. And now that we look again into your word, we pray for direction and leadership of your spirit. May your truth reach each heart and accomplish the purpose you intend. Oh God, please help us. We can open up a book, but only you can open up the heart and the eyes of our understanding and pray that you will. Do a spiritual work in each of our lives. We plead for your mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. I've entitled the message today, The Close, and that might actually be quite obvious to you since this is the last message in the book of Ecclesiastes, and we are in the last chapter, so the close would seem to be fitting. But actually, I'm using the word with a broader uh, range of meaning in mind, because there are several contexts in which we use the word close to mean something a whole lot more than just the end. Let me give you some examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. Some of you know that this week, the World Series is going on at Globe Life Stadium in Arlington, Texas. And the LA Dodgers are trying to defeat the Tampa Bay Rays. And so maybe you've been keeping track of that. Today is game number five, and it starts just after five o'clock this afternoon, if you were interested. In the world of baseball, and I can't say that I'm an overly zealous baseball fan, but I have been known to watch some playoff games. And uh, there is a pitcher that a team will bring in at the end of a game. And uh, if, the, if the team happens to be ahead and they don't want the other team to, to make a comeback, they'll bring in a pitcher who has a wicked fastball to kind of close down the game, and they call him the closer. And he'll pitch no more than two, maybe at the most three innings. And by that time, his arm is done. But hopefully, the other team doesn't get a hit at all in the last two, two and a half, three innings. That's called the closer. I want to pitch it to you a different way. In fact, the second example I want to use also uses the word pitch, but in a different way. Some of you perhaps have been salesmen in the past and have sold things to people or tried to get them to buy jewelry, cars, or insurance, or what have you. And often the salesman, is going to, he has his pitch down. He's going to sell the product or the service that he's offering. And at the end of his pitch, he is going to give you some options. And he's going, to, he's going to try to bait you in to making the sale that day. That final part of his pitch is called the, the close. And there are various ways he can go about doing that. I'm not going to bore you, but I've made my point, right? The word close has a much broader range of meaning than just to mean to close a book or to finish a book such as Ecclesiastes. It is in the second sense that I really want you to think about the book of Ecclesiastes and the message today. Because what I believe Solomon is doing as he comes to the end of the book is he is like the salesman. He wants you to buy in. He wants you to be a client. He wants you to put your name on the the dotted line. He wants you to make a contract with God to go forward in life the way Solomon prescribes. He doesn't simply want you to go, oh boy, that was an interesting book. I'm glad we took some time and, you know, investigated that on Sunday morning for a few weeks. Actually, if you had that attitude, he'd be very disgusted with you. He wants you to do something. He wants you to respond to what he said. You know, this is true about any message that God gives to you. He wants you to respond. Truth isn't just truth for knowledge's sake. Truth is to move you to action. Let me show you what I'm talking about. We're in Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. And verse number 1 begins with these words. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, he says. 
While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. The first thing that Solomon wants you to, to do is to remember. Now, in our English language, we think remember means recall. Man, I didn't forget, man. I showed up on time on Sunday morning. Pastor, mark that down. I was here on time. No, 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 no. That's the English word means to remember, recall, don't forget. Now, that word can mean that in Hebrew, but it can also mean something more. In fact, it's used in context when God remembers somebody. Let me give you an example of this in the Old Testament. Remember Hannah? She is the, the, uh, one of two wives of Elkanah. Penina, she can have children. Hannah has no children. She's distressed. She prays at the, the tabernacle, God, please give me a son. And this is what the Bible says when she gets home after this prayer. 1 Samuel 1.19, And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. It doesn't mean that he, he, he had forgotten her and then when she got home he remembered that she existed. That's not the point. The point was, when she got home, God remembered that little promise that Hannah had made at the tabernacle, and God got involved and made sure that her womb conceived that time. So it's more than just remembering. The word remember means take decisive action. And what Solomon wants you to do at the end of this book is not go, man, that was a good story. I'm glad he shared those, those proverbs with me. Uh, I, maybe I should remember some or maybe hang one on my wall. No, 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 no. He wants you to process what you've heard and then take decisive action. So, how do I go about doing that? Solomon is going to kind of push you in the direction he wants you to go now so that you can get more out of life. And the key is don't close the book. Don't close the book on God. He's going to give you two reasons why you really need to do something with what you've heard in the book of Ecclesiastes. Because Solomon believes, and he's trying to convince you, this really is the best way to live. You need to get serious about God before your time runs out. So I'm going to do my best to couch these two arguments that he's going to finish the book with in ways that you can appreciate and understand. The first way I'm going to do this is, is talk about one of the common examples or uh, objections that people raise to Christianity when I talk to them, especially young people. You know, somebody will say, you know, I've got plenty of time. I, I hear what you're saying, and I don't disagree with this God and Jesus stuff, but the, I just got, I've got too much to do. I, I've, got to, I've got to make my million, and I've got to explore the world and build a mansion. And after I get the things done that I want to, then I'll catch up with God. And Solomon is saying, ha, ha, whoa, 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 whoa. You, you don't understand. You, you're, you don't want to put God on delay. Remember now thy creator in the days of your youth. Don't wait till your deathbed to repent. Don't wait till your deathbed to get right with God. Don't wait till your deathbed to figure out, oh, I wish I would have gone back and done my life a different way. He's saying, no, listen, this is the way you need to do it. Remember your, your Creator in the days of your youth. This isn't the first time he said it. He said back in chapter number 11 and verse number 9, he said the same thing. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. Why, are we keep, why do we keep putting off getting right with God? Why do we keep putting off doing things God's way, do it now. Why? Number one, because your life and my life is temporary. This seems to be the emphasis that Solomon is going to make in the verses 1 through 8. E evil days are coming, years in which you're going to have no pleasure. Anyone know about that in this room? Years of life that are really empty of pleasure because all you're doing is dealing with pain and stress and difficulty and a body that won't work. What's Solomon after? He reminds you, life is temporary. Letter A, life is fleeting. Remember him in the days of your youth. The evil days mentioned here in verse number one don't mean violent, sinful, morally evil. It just means times of distress or trouble. You want to make time for God now before days get difficult and you're distressed and you, you don't even give God 
the time of day. Why is Solomon being so gloomy? Why does he talk about evil days and years in which I have no pleasure in them? He's reminding you life is short. Time is fleeting. It's flying by and there's nothing you can do to slow down time. Someone has said, time goes. Ah, no, alas, time stays and you go. Your days and years are scrolling by like numbers on a gas pump and one day difficulty will cloud in upon your life and you won't be able to escape. If only you knew, if only someone knew in this room that this week you could be meeting the Creator, it would change the way you lived. Life is fading, life is fleeing, fleeting away, it's also fading. Solomon uses word pictures starting in verse number 2 and running down through verse number 7. There's general agreement that he's talking about aging and moving toward death, but there isn't always agreement on what each of these individual things mean in these verses. So I think the overall picture is to remember, we'll bring up the next screen, the overall picture uh, is to remember that your life is coming to an end. Your sun is setting. He says in verse number two, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. We understand the cycle of a day. The sun is at its zenith about midday, somewhere around 12 o'clock, but then hastens quickly to the west and sets. And so is a life. A life comes up and it's vibrant for a short period of time. And then before you know it, it's sunset. The, the life has passed. The, the, the life is almost over. And so he mentions these, sun, uh, these bodies in the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars. He mentions the clouds return after the rain. You know what's supposed to happen after it rains? The clouds part and the sun shines. But the older you get, you know what happens? One rain cloud comes over and dumps on you, and before it's gone, another one has moved in. And he's talking about the gloominess of the end of life. Your sun is setting. He also says your body is failing. In verse number 3, he says, In the day when the keepers of the house tremble. In fact, I want the overall picture here is of a house falling apart. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble. Keepers is probably a reference to the hands or the arms, and they tremble. And the keepers are the guardians. You can't trust the, guard, the ones that can protect you. You can't even hardly make a fist anymore. And if your fist can hold a gun, you're like, get away, thief, leave, because I'm going to shoot you if you... You get the point. The keepers are trembling. He goes on and says, and the strong men bow themselves down, the legs become weak, the back stoops. The grinders cease because they are few. The grinders are probably referring to the teeth. The grinders become few. They rot, decay, fall out. Thank God for good dentists, and most of us are not in that predicament, but it used to be a regular part of manhood or womanhood is teeth falling out, not being able to chew your food. And those that look out the windows be darkened. Who's looking out the w windows? Is a, is a metaphor for the eyes and for light and being able to see and the the windows grow dark, the shutters get pulled, the curtains, and you can't see. It's hard to see out anymore. Then verse number four, the doors shall be shut in the streets. This one is a difficult one, a variety of opinion. Some think it has to do with the teeth falling out and the lips kind of curving in and the doors kind of close, and it doesn't look as pretty as it used to be on that front door of the house. You know what I'm talking about? That could be what it's talking about. When the sound of the grinding is low, this could be referring back to the teeth, but he hasn't talked to the, about the teeth for a couple of phrases. And I actually think it, this has to do with the idea, you know, when, when a town or a city is busy, you hear the mill grinding. There's activity. Things are going on. But the older you get, the less activity is going on. You're not into the daily grind anymore. You're not running nine to five anymore. Time is running out. In fact, you mark your days by inactivity rather than activity. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You're shaking your heads. I'm not going to point you out. And he shall rise at the voice of the bird. Rise at the voice of the bird. Some of you are up with the birds, whether you want to be or not. Yeah, because you don't sleep as well as you used to be, a sign of aging. And all the daughters of music shall be brought low. I, I understand this. I go into people's houses, right? All the daughters of music, we could add to this music or entertainment. All the delights, daughters, 
usually a sign of delight and blessing, but now you, you can't hardly make out the notes in the music. You go into the house and you have to turn down the TV so you can talk to people. Eh? Eh? What, what, what did you say? Because it's, the people are hard of hearing. Verse number five, and when they shall be afraid of that which is high and fears shall be in the way. Uh, uncanny fears, fear of heights, fear of going out and getting ar- among the bustle of traffic and trying to figure out times when I can go out when there aren't going to be people that push me over. A sign of old age. The almond tree shall flourish. When the almond tree flourishes or, or blossoms, does anyone know the color of almond bo- blossoms? White. White. It's probably a sign of the graying of the hair and turning to white, a sign of older age. The grasshopper shall be a burden. You know what a grasshopper does? Eats a little bit on this stalk and bounces off to the next stalk to start its project. And that's the way, in youth, that's the way most of us are. All right, got one thing done. Where's the next thing on my my, my to-do list? Let me check that off. Then I'm going to bounce over here and do something else. And when when you get older... It's a burden for the grasshopper to move. You're not bouncing from task to task. You're hardly getting around. You're pushing one of these things in front of you. Or you've got one of the, those crooked things under your arm as you're making your way through life. You're not bouncing around like a grasshopper anymore. And desire shall fail. Some think it refers to sexual desire. The term is more uh, broad than that. Probably just means you don't get into any projects. Someone says, you know, you could go back and clean up the yard or paint the fence. Yeah, one of these days I'll get to that. One of these days, desire fails. What's Solomon's point? Your body is fading fast. It's giving out. Eventually the rat in the rat race slows down and the hamster wheel stops. Look at the next verses, which bring this even Closer to Solomon's point. Verse 6. Oh, I'm sorry. The end of verse number 5. Because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the street. The word long is olam. We met this word in chapter number 3. It means of long duration or forever. Some translations render it eternal. Solomon isn't really talking about eternal life. It's just that you do have a future destination. You go, over, you go to your long duration home. And mourners go about the streets. You get that, right? Someone dies, friends and family show up and mourn the loss. He's talking about death knocking on the door. If we had any question about that, we see it in the the next couple verses here. Or ever the silver cord be loosed or the golden bowl be drunken. He's talking about the fact that death is waiting. Let's go to the next slide. Death is waiting. And he gives two images here in verses 6 and 7. I want to push through these, but... The silver cord be loosed or the golden bowl be broken. This is probably talking about a lamp. And you have to remember in in ancient times, lamps were vessels that held oil and they had a wick coming out one end. And it was the wet, moistened wick that provided light for the home. And often these were set up on a wall, a ledge or an outcropping, and the light would be set up to give light to the whole house. Now it's just a flick of the switch. But in Scripture, a lamp is a symbol for light. In fact, many times in the Proverbs, God says the lamp of the wicked will be put out. He isn't talking about the thing that's hanging on the side of the wall. He's talking about what? Their life will be put out. Proverbs chapter 20 um, and verse number 20 is a cross-reference if you want that. Some believe, though, that it's not just talking about a lamp falling off and breaking being the end of life. It could be that. It might be that Solomon is using a metaphor or picture here to really talk about the spinal cord, the silver cord that goes down your back, that connects to the brain, that runs the whole show. The silver cord is loosed, and the golden bowl is broken. The end of your nervous system. Perhaps... The next image is that of a pitcher and a wheel, the wheel being a pulley by which you pull the pitcher of water, a clay pot up out of the well, and you fill your vessel and you drop it down again and you pull it back up. And and water can also be a picture of life in Scripture. Drink of the water of life, Revelation talks about. So it could be that that's the emphasis here, that at some point your life 
is like a clay pot and breaks and cannot bring up the water of life anymore. Or some have suggested that the pitcher might be a metaphor for your heart that pumps all the fluid through your body, and one day the pitcher breaks, your heart stops, and blood no longer flows, life-giving blood no longer flows through your body. I don't care which one you pick, the point's the same. Your life is short, your lamp is about to go out, and your water's about to dry up. Ooh. Vivid pictures that Solomon has given us. If we have any doubt about that and being in the interpretation, we can look at verse number seven. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. This should stand out to you as Christians immediately as this is like creation in reverse. How did God make man? He scooped together the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So now God takes away the spirit and the dust goes back into the ground and you have creation in reverse or the termination of life. So why would Solomon give such a gloomy picture? I mean, that's the thing that troubled me this week as I was reading. Man, every one of these phrases I read, something else is going to go wrong with me if I make it that far. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I haven't seen your faces smiling a whole lot in the last eight or ten minutes, right? Because this is all like grown. Why is he doing this? He's trying to remember the young person that would be reading his book who would be thinking, i got plenty of time, I'll get to God later. And he said, hey, hey, whoa, 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 don't you understand how fast the sun comes up, reaches its zenith, and it falls into the sunset faster than you can count. And so your life will be passed before you know it. To the young recruit who thinks he can watch a single Rambo movie, and think he knows everything about warfare, the sergeant says, listen up, buddy. What I'm telling you here, your life depends upon it. In fact, if you don't get serious right now, you're going to fall apart on the battlefield, and we're going to be bringing you home in a body bag. And that sounds like push. I mean, this is the passion which Solomon is speaking with right now. I know you're not a soldier, but you best get serious about God while you still can before your time runs out. Let me tell you about Larry Rust. Larry Rust and Tom Cantor were neighbors in Southern California. They both had ranches not far from each other. And because they were both into ranching and they were neighbors, they developed a friendship and got to be quite good friends. Because Tom Cantor knew the Lord and was interested in doing God's business, he tried to bring up God with Larry as much as he could. And Larry, every time the subject came up, would stuff it back down Tom's throat. Tom had gotten to the point where he liked Larry, but he just knew if he brought up the subject of God and Jesus and the Bible, he wasn't going to get anywhere, so he just backed off and didn't say anything. Then one day, Larry got prostate cancer, and his condition got worse, and eventually ended up in the Naval Hospital in Balboa Park in San Diego. And there, Tom decided he needed to go visit his friend again and talk to him about God. So Tom got prepared, he prayed up, he made the journey down to Balboa Park, he brought his big black Bible with him, and he found the cancer ward, walked over to where Larry's room was, and as soon as he entered Larry's room, and Larry saw Tom, and Larry saw Tom's Bible, he said, no, no God, no Bible, he started shouting, it was so loud, the whole scene became a public spectacle. People started popping their heads out of the other rooms. Nurses were looking down at the hall toward Tom. Tom didn't know what to do. And he just said, okay, Larry, okay, I get it. I'll go away. And so Tom left. He left thinking, you know, I'll just give a few days for, Tom, or for Larry to cool off, and then I'll go back and visit Larry. Maybe the next time I won't take my Bible, I'll just chat with him. A few days later, Tom went back to the hospital, found Larry's room, but Larry wasn't there. So Tom doubled back down to the nurse's station and asked where, Tom might, or where Larry might be. And he asked at the nurse's station, where is Larry? The nurse looked up at him from her desk and she said, who wants to know? He thought, well, that's a strange tone. But he managed to get out his first name. Well, I'm Tom. And the nurse said, oh, so you're Tom. Yeah. Then the nurse said, 
Well, let me tell you something, Tom. Larry Russ died last night, but all through the night, Larry was screaming, Tom, Tom, where is Tom? Bring Tom, bring Tom. Life is temporary, and time is running out. So you best be ready before God closes the book on you. Are you ready? I'm talking to you. You in this room, right now, are you ready? Have you settled up with God? You know, it would be a horrible thing for you to cruise along life, to attend a church like this, to be pled with week after week, to get right with God, to settle up with God, to take Jesus as your Savior, and you say, one of these days, I got plenty of time. And suddenly you're in Larry's bed. And there is no Tom at your door with a Bible to help. You say, well, you know, that, that's, that's another story, that's another state, that's another person, that's not me. But it will happen to each of us in this room. At one time, we'll be in that bed. That's why Solomon reminds us, remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Take decisive action now. Why? Verse number eight, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Solomon finishes where he started in chapter one and verse number two. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. All is frustration, all is fleeing away, all is futile. You've got to do this now, don't wait. That's the first objection. Many people, I have plenty of, plenty of time, I'll wait. And Solomon urges you, don't wait. Take this, make this decision now. There's a second part to his argument. And I want to look at that finally in verses 9 through the end of the book. But to get there, I want to talk to you about something else. There's another objection I believe is common in our day. And very likely, if I know human, you know, the more people change, the more they stay the same. So human nature really hasn't changed a whole lot. So my guess is people in Solomon's day thought the same way. The second argument goes like this. You know, I understand that you found something that works for you. And, I, and I'm happy for you, really I am. But, you know, um, I I'm glad I explain, it helps you to explain the world and its problems. But, you know, I'm, I'm really not for this. I don't think it's for me. We call this postmodernism. What's good for you is not good for me. That might be your truth, but it's not my truth. There's a plethora of truth out there and we get to pick, I'm not buying in. Postmodernism, millennials, people growing up in your house, in your family, and in our community. Just because it's right for you doesn't mean it's right for me. I think this kind of thinking has been around for a long time. So Solomon's words beginning in verse number nine attack another common objection people have to settling up with God and doing things his way. And this has to do with thinking, well, there are many paths I could choose from. Well, Solomon asks you to consider this, friend. Verse number nine, moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. We'll read on in just a moment, but Solomon is asking you, please think through, not only is your life temporary, but the words that I gave to you are trustworthy. I'm giving you the truth. I'm preaching it to you straight. Don't just go looking for any old other idea out there. This is, this is where it is. So consider the source. Consider me. I'm the preacher, and I've tried to set these things. These, I think Solomon is just like, I'm not a senile old king and I'm not a cranky old pessimist. I really have tried to give you God's truth in the, in the, in the best possible way. I, I've done it in acceptable words, words of truth, proverbs. This is where it's at. You've got to take it in. So this is a wise man putting down words that any man should, should be able to understand. But in verse number 11, he actually goes a step further. Solomon says that these words are not only his, but he says they are given from one shepherd. Do you see that at the end of verse number 11? 
I believe this isn't talking about Solomon, this is talking about God. So he goes from verse number one talking about remember your creator to remembering your God as a shepherd who's leading you by the hand. And what does a shepherd have? He has a, he has a goad. Most of us are not shepherds. And we haven't herded any sheep or even any kind of livestock. But there's a prod. There's cattle prods. There's sheep prods. There's goads. And on the end of that prod, there's usually a point, something that pinches the rump of the sheep when it gets inserted. And so Solomon is saying, listen, it's not just me who's given you wise words. It is the shepherd who is poking you in the right direction. And not only that, these are like well-driven nails. What does a shepherd need well-driven nails for? Well, shepherds are nomadic. They have to go where the grass is green. When the grass gets chewed, they got to move on. And so temporary housing for a shepherd usually involved a tent. And every tent I've ever been a part of has had stakes. And you put the stakes down so that the tent doesn't blow away on you. And so Solomon is making a graphic picture. Here's your God, your shepherd. He's not only poking you in the right direction. He's giving you truths to which you can stake down your life so that you're not blown over in the storms and the wind. Stake your life then on what the shepherd has given to you. So friend, consider the source. Wise words from a loving shepherd, the creator God who wants to help you on the right way. Oh yeah. You can almost hear a scoffer whispering in the back of the room. Is someone talking back there? Yeah, but there are many books of wisdom. This is not the only philosophy of a life that has ever been written. Shouldn't I explore other ones first before I settle down on Ecclesiastes and what Solomon says here? Maybe a little bit more reading will be helpful for me. Look what he says in verse number 12. And further by these my son be admonished. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Now, I hung this verse up on my door when I was in college. Much study is a weariness to the flesh. But that isn't the context. The context is people are thinking, I got, man, there's so many books of wisdom out there. There's so many resources I can go to. But man, I'm just not going to settle down with one book. I got to read them all. And I got to pull it all together. And somewhere in there, I'll get to the wisdom of how to do life. And Solomon said, no, 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 no. You can chase books till there is no end. You can weary yourself to the bone studying, but you're not going to get any closer to the truth than what I've given you. So Solomon gently appeals to his audience. He calls him for the first time, my son. It's the only time we find this title. He's, he's appealing like a father would to his kid, like I do to my boy. Please stop beating on each other. Please stop arguing with one another. My son, please, are you hearing me? Listen to me. Stop chasing Dr. Phil. Stop chasing Dr. Oz. Stop looking for the forever wisdom of Wayne Dyer. All of that research is going to wear you out. Just trust me. I've done the research. I've read the books. I'm giving you the truth. Don't repeat the same study. Follow the good shepherd. Will you follow him? These words are trustworthy considering their source. They're also trustworthy considering the scope or the reach of these words. We finish now with verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In verse number 13, Solomon brings the book all together and he sums it up where we've already been. Fear God, remember? What, what, how did Solomon tell us to do life? Enjoy God's gifts. Fear God's name. Walk in God's wisdom. And so he ends, he says, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Do it this way. I don't want to recover that ground. We've already heard that in this series of messages. But what I want you to focus is on is something new here in verse 13. The conclusion of the matter is this. This is the whole duty of man. If you're holding the King James Version today, you'll notice the word duty is in italics, which means it was inserted by the translators to help flow or understanding. It does not appear in the original. Literally, the Hebrew reads this way. 
This is man's all. Well, there are a couple ways you can take that, and there's divergent opinions. I'm going to give you both and then tell you why I picked the one I did, all right? Here they are. One is, this is man's everything. This is his essence. This sums up the whole thing. This is what man needs to do. And so you get the idea of your duty, responsibility. This is what it takes to be a man in God's world. Do it. And that is one way you could take the words. You could take the same Hebrew words, though, and get them to say, this is for every man. No matter who you are. Where you live, your nationality or religious affiliation, these words apply to you. And if I'm right in, in my mark here that Solomon is sharing this wisdom with the visitors to his kingdom who have come to search out his wealth and his wisdom, then he's saying to them, listen, this isn't just for the Jews. And you need to be thinking, this isn't just the ranting of a king who lived in the third millennia, uh, uh, th three millennia ago. This is the truth of God for you, and this applies to everybody. Whether you lived as a Jew in Israel under Solomon, or whether you live in the United States in Tucson today, this is for every man. And following the flow of the argument, I think it's the second one. I could be wrong. But this is for every man. This applies to you, so don't rule yourself out. So don't put your hand up to me like this and say, oh, well, that's good for you, but I've got my own truth. No, Solomon is saying this applies to every person in this room, every person who comments in contact of this book. You need to do what I'm telling you. You need to enjoy God's gift, fear God's name, and walk in God's wisdom. It's what you need to do. So don't be a fool. This book's for you. Don't close it and walk away. Let these good words shape the remainder of your life. There really are only two ways to do life. You can keep trying to do the best you can, or you can follow the yellow brick, yellow brick road that God has laid out for you in this book. You can have a great life. You can get more out of life. You can have a life of meaning and purpose if you'll get ready and settle up with your Creator. It's time then to take decisive action. Remember your Creator. If you go on without him, you'll regret it. Now is the time and invite God into your life. There's another way to flip this around. We go to the next screen. Don't walk away. Don't close the book on God. Another way to look at this is to go back to that, well, I'm glad it works for you, but that doesn't work for me. That might be truth for you, but that's not truth for me. Maybe you want to file what you've heard and continue your own research. Go down your own path, but all you're inviting is a lot more time and frustration. The Good Shepherd has pointed out the right way. Will you follow? So it's time to get serious about God. It is time to get serious about God. It is time to do life the right way. Solomon has told you what it is, and he's given you two great arguments. Life is too temporary to do anything else, and these are the best words. They're trustworthy. You can count on them. Go this way. Let me finish by telling you about a group of people here in the state of Arizona. The story comes from about 10 years ago. It's a, a Baptist church in Phoenix. A men's group is getting ready to go up into the Arizona wilderness. And they choose some old mining roads. They're going to go up and camp and retreat. They're going to have a couple of days in the country. This is November 2009. And on the caravan, there's several SUVs and trucks and Jeeps in the caravan. The lead car suddenly disappears. The rest of the party slows up and they look down and the lead car, somehow the, the road had given away, the Cow Creek Road, some of you might be familiar with it, gave away. And the SUV dropped 100 feet and killed all four people that were in the car. A man, 47, his son, 16, Micah, who's pictured now on the screen. A 67-year-old man and a man in his 70s, I don't recall, but... What started out to be an enjoyable journey into the Arizona wilderness ended up to be a nightmare for the church and those families. I want to finish this way. Contrary to popular opinion, not all roads are going to get you home safely. Solomon has shown you the best road to travel in this book. So the question is, will you get on the right road or keep going your own way? I hope you're motivated to get going with God today. Father in heaven, thank you for the word of God and for touching our hearts even as we've gone through this material. Lord, I pray that you'll...